so wonderful to see each and every one of you here today. Good to be in your presence. Good to be worshiping God with you. Uh, let me invite you to turn in your Bible to Ephesians, the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Or you may open your smartphone and your tablet. We don't want to be myopic, uh, narrow-minded in thinking that uh, you must have paper Bible. Um, but it's good to know that you have your Bible um, and you are able to handle it. So turn in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Today we start a series of lessons on spiritual warfare. Someone say spiritual warfare. Those coming before you this month will present and drill down further on the enemy and his schemes. They're going to develop the theme, the battle-ready Christian. Also, they're going to be developing the subject, maintaining the fight and fighting with the general who we recognize as God. Today I want to raise your consciousness, your awareness, and remind you of the fact that we are indeed in a battle. We are indeed in warfare. And I want to encourage you today to fight. Eh? I want to encourage you to fight on today. Later on tonight, we want to uh, be looking more at some examples in warfare. Examples in warfare. But tonight, I mean, today I want to remind you in a pointed, direct, strong way that you are in a battle, you are in warfare. And I want to embellish your zeal, enhance your zeal to continue to fight on. Is that all right? Is that all right in the back? Those of you who are visiting us, we say to you, welcome. You will be acknowledged um, more a little bit as time goes on. The success of any army depends on how well it knows its enemy, how well it knows its enemy's capabilities. That is the kind of weapons the enemy has and the amount of men on their side. Further, success depends on how well the enemy's tactics are known. What type of strategy and scheme will be employed and how can they be defended against? And this is being played out in our world today as the U.S. and its forces uh, fight against that terror group known as what? ISIS in the Middle East. Uh, I am told that they are being defeated bit by bit, block by block. It is said that during the Gulf War in the early 90s, the Iraqi army was totally overwhelmed by the coalition forces, again led by uh, the U.S. Because the coalition forces had superior weapons and outstanding counter strategies in fighting that war. The Iraqi army surrendered by the hundreds, if not the thousands. Christians today, you and I, are involved in a battle in warfare. We are in a fight. Do you believe that? We are in a battle, but not one that is physical, but one that is spiritual. The text read indicates that we wrestle or struggle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, 
against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Wow. That is who the enemy is. That is who we fight against. Yes, we are in a fight, whether you realize it or not. And you better realize it quickly, and we are here to help you become more aware of the fact that you are in a fight. This fight is a spiritual one that has to do with what we, and it doesn't have to do with what we can see. It's a spiritual one. It has not nothing to do with flesh and blood. You are not the enemy, physical you. And the person sitting next to you is not the enemy. But what is influencing you and me, you and I, that is the enemy. The spiritual forces in heavenly places, they are the enemy. Like the coalition forces in Desert Storm, we can be successful if we truly realize that we have superior weaponry. And if we know the enemy and all that he can throw at us, do you believe that we could be successful today? Come on now. I, I'm here for the purpose of convincing you that you could be successful today in your spiritual fight against the enemy. Amen? Amen. And, today, and so today we want to know where we stand in the spiritual battle. Secondly, we want to examine the enemy and his tactics. Thirdly, we want to identify the weapons available to us which when used will bring us success in this walk. And lastly, we want to look at our will to fight the enemy. Oh, that's interesting, eh? Our will to fight the enemy. Okay. So firstly, we want to be reminded of who we are and where we stand as those belonging to Christ. Whose side are you on is the ultimate question. Whose side are you on? For the believers, the Bible says in Colossians 1 and verse 13, For he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. And so we are in his kingdom having left the other kingdom. Praise be to God. We are in his kingdom having left the other kingdom and now we stand aligned with Christ's army. We are on Jesus' side. Jesus at one point uh, in the scriptures told some of the Pharisees gathered, you are of your father, the devil. Obedient disciples of Christ have as their father, the eternal father, the God of the heavens, the ancient of days, the almighty God. You are a child of the king. Again, Jesus says in scripture, who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. All those who have yielded to Christ, surrendered to him and are living for him are gathering with him and are a part of his army. You get the bearings now? Do you know where you stand? As Joshua was going to take Jericho, he saw a man standing opposite him and posed a very interesting question to the man who was later revealed as an angel. Look with me please at Joshua chapter 5. Come on now, turn in your Bibles. Joshua chapter 5 verses 13 uh, to 15 as we get a glimpse of the side that we are on and what makes up the army of God and who makes up the army of God Joshua chapter 5 beginning at verse 13 and this is again as Joshua was going to uh, cross uh, and take Jericho and now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. 
And Joshua went on, uh, went to him and said to him, Are you for us or our adversaries? And he said, No, rather, I indeed come now as captain of the host of God, host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, What has my Lord to do to say to the servant or his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Instructions that we see given to Moses also. Remove your sandals, for the ground you stand on is holy ground. Amen. The angel said that he was captain of the host of the Lord, the army of God. The host of God exists and we are a part of it. We are on the Lord's side. Praise be to God. We are on his side and there are more with us than there are with them. Amen. There are more with us if you're fighting a battle this morning. Understand that there are more with us than there are with them. Amen. It was Elijah who said concerning his servant Gehazi, Lord open his eyes that he may see that there are more with us than there are with them. We now want to look at the enemy and his tactics. Jesus said in Luke 10 and 18 that he was watching Satan fall from heaven. You see, Jesus knows him and recognizes him. Isn't it good for us to know the one who knows everything about the enemy? You know the one who knows everything about the enemy. Amen. You have an advantage. You are in a privileged position. Uh, John 12 and 31 describes Satan as the ruler of this world. Whatever happened uh, in the spiritual realm prior to human beings being created um, is God's business. Let me repeat that again. Whatever happened in the spiritual realm before human beings were created is God's business. Satan was lifted up in heaven and wanted the glory for himself. And now we are here with no choice in the matter. We find ourselves in a battle. We find ourselves in warfare. No choice in the matter. We are able to accept the influence of the enemy or the influence of Almighty God as we exercise our will and our power to choose. In Job chapter 1 and verse 6 to 11, we are told that the sons of men presented themselves before God. And among them was who? Satan. This is an interesting reading. Let's read it together. You're going to go to Job in the Old Testament. You know where it is? Go to Job. Job and the chapters 1. Uh, there are many of you in this building today who have a love for the book of Job, the character of Job, and the strength received from the book of Job as you go through your trials and difficulties. Continue to read the book of Job. And so we understand that Satan presented himself as did also uh, the sons of men. Some argue that the sons of men here are angels. Some argue that. Let's look from verse 6. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? 
For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. You often say that God saw Job as a treasure. He saw Job as someone to be held up as an example for all to see. And the fact that he was counting him worthy for the test tells me that it ain't necessarily that you did something wrong, which explains why you're going through some rough times. It means sometimes that you're doing some good stuff. And God is counting on you to get through the period of testing. Amen? Then Satan, verse 9, then Satan answered, The Lord, does God fear, does Job fear God for nothing? Has thou not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You know, in other words, you're protecting him. Let me, let me, let me touch him and you're going to see that he'll curse you to your face. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and uh, his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth thy hand now and touch all that he has and he will surely curse thee to thy face. As Satan uh, has the freedom to roam the earth, there seems to be a battering going on for the souls of men. Whereby God allows the people of God to be tested and men to be tested at the hands of Satan uh, as in the case of Job. We are caught in the cycle uh, here uh, where the flesh wars against uh, the spirit and the spirit wars against the flesh. Concerning Satan, he is a deceiver and a very crafty being. He deceived Eve in Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 to 7. God told Adam and Eve that the day they ate of the fruit of, of the tree in the middle of the garden they sh would surely what? Die. Satan told her a lie. Man, you shall surely not. There it is, that three letter word. You shall surely what? Not die. And we know what happened after that. Sometimes I wonder, I say, God, why don't you just, why don't you just like start over? You know, just wipe, take all, take all of my name out the way and start anew. Start afresh. It is through that act that sin entered the world. And you and I today are exposed to a continuous battle. But God is God. And I am uh, the clay and he is the what? He is the potter. He does what he pleases. Concerning Satan, he causes us to rationalize. That's a somewhat uh, big word. And sometimes I get tongue twisted when I try to pronounce it also. He causes us, that is Satan, to rationalize. We find every excuse for not doing God's will or being obedient to him. Oh, no one is going to miss this $10 bill because, man, he's making all kinds of money in this store. They ain't going to miss no $10 bills, man. I, I get plenty of bills to, to pay. I need this to make up. I'm just a lowly paid cashier. I need this to make up with some bills that I have to pay. He's not going to, this man who is wealthy and, uh, uh, wealthy and rich, he's not going to miss this $10 bill. And so therefore, that person rationalizes. Lower God's standard, lower what God is calling them to and find reason to partake. I, if I cheat just this one time, no one is going to see me. Who is telling you that? <laughs> Who is telling you that? The enemy, the deceiver, a crafty being. I don't need to give to the church treasury. Everyone else is giving. And they have enough money. Who is telling you that? Anyone in the back? Who is telling you that? Satan, eh? And it goes on and on as we rationalize 
as we lower God's standard, as we find reasons to do that which is wrong. So we find excuses to not do what is right. All because of Satan and his being after us. Satan is relentless as we seek to profile the enemy. He is relentless. He left Jesus for a season after temp tempting him in the wilderness. He left him for what? A season. That tells me that he's, he was about to come back at the opportune time. Even after a victory, we need not let our guards down. Victory today does not guarantee victory tomorrow. Amen. We are in a spiritual battle. This is spiritual warfare. He is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. First Peter 5 and 8. His intentions is to devour you. To what? Man, he wants to destroy you. He has no good intentions towards you. And he takes no prisoners. He wants to destroy you. He and his hosts have bad intentions towards you. Towards you and towards me. If he could take you down. You see, his fate has been predetermined. F.A. what? T.E. has been predetermined. His, he knows that time is ticking. But if he could get as many to go with him as possible, then his objective would be uh, achieved. He can show himself as an angel of light. All while, according to 2 Corinthians uh, 11, 14 to 15, all while seducing and deceiving. You know, he can show himself as an angel of, li of light, all while getting you to lower your guard. He comes looking righteous. Young ladies, Satan can coach scriptures too. And so as he whispers in your ears, you must be discerning, amen. Uh, and alert because he ain't coming with the pitchfork in hand and dressed in red and the two horns he coming dressed good smelling good looking righteous sometimes sounding righteous but with bad intentions he can deceive the doctrine as there are doctrines of demons according to what the scripture says in first timothy 4 1 through 5. Turn in your Bibles there just so we could get an appreciation. First Timothy chapter uh, 4 beginning at verse 1. We're going to read to verse 5 as we appreciate that he comes not only appearing righteous but he comes with doctrines described as doctrines of, of demons. But the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of what? Devils or demons. By means of the hypocrisy of liars said in their own conscience, as with a branding iron. Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who, de who believe and know the truth. So that tells me right there. Wait, wait, let me read more. It says, for everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. For it is sanctified by the means of the word of God and prayer. I wanted to say that this scripture right here tells me that it's all right to eat a piece of pork. A piece of bacon. Amen. Don't let no one put no chains on you that you have been liberated from under the new covenant. That it was prohibited under the old covenant, but under the new. Jesus at one point said, Man, man, you only understand what they say yet. What goes into the man doesn't defile him. Is what comes out of the man that what? defiles him. You still understand? What you put into your mouth, the body uses and then the rest is rejected. 
It doesn't bring you nearer to God or take you uh, away from God. Now, I, I say be foolish. Yeah, you don't just sit down and eat a whole can of lard. <laughs> Those of you who know what that is. A whole can of, of fat. You got to be wise, right? Those who teach and support the things highlighted in the text, 1 Timothy chapter 4, um, support doctrines of, of demons. Doctrine is important. We'll be teaching uh, share with individuals as, as gospel, as God's truth is very important. Yes, it is. What you believe and teach others can determine their eternal destination, whether they go to heaven or go to hell. Don't ever let anyone tell you that doctrine is not important. Oh, it doesn't matter what you teach. Oh, we all believe in Jesus. But wait a minute. You, you, you're teaching things contrary to God's word. And, and Jesus himself said, in vain do they worship me teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. My worship to God can be fruitless because of, uh, of, of me adhering to teachings and doctrines uh, of men. What is interesting is that the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2 and 11 that we are not ignorant of his schemes, that is Satan's schemes. We, uh, we see and know his weapons. But many times we elect to walk right on in. Is that true? Is that true? But the Carlton all the way to the back. Is that true? We know, we know what the deal. We know his schemes, but we elect to just what? Walk right on in. Our resolve must be what? Stronger. We must be what? Wiser. And we must be sober-minded. What are some of the defense mechanisms we uh, are able to use? What, what are some uh, of the defense mechanisms that are available to us? How can we gain the victory over the enemy? First of all, know that the victory is possible. What is possible? Come on, what is possible? The victory is possible, man. I can defeat the enemy. I don't have to remain where I am. With God, all things are possible. And no weapons formed against us shall prosper. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 17. Further know that the weapons of our warfare according, are not uh, according to the flesh. There is no need for cutlasses or guns or rock or even a nuclear weapon. There are no needs for those type of weaponry. You go to uh, 2 Corinthians. Come on now. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Whereas I hope you're taking some notes, those of you who are note takers. Uh, we encourage you to take notes at times. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 beginning at uh, verse 1. It says, Now I, Paul, myself urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who, uh, who am meek with, when face to face with you, but bold toward you when absent. Paul continues to argue uh, and make the case with the Corinthian church. They had the view that Paul was, was strong in his letters, but weak in present. In verse, uh, uh, verse 2 says, I ask that when I am present, I may not be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to what? The flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful. For the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculation and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Yes, mighty fortresses can be destroyed. Strongholds can uh, be given up. And deliverance made as divinely powerful weapons are used. 
Know for sure that you stand in the position of power. Someone say power. You stand in the position of power because you have aligned yourself with God and now God is all powerful. The scripture says in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them. That is the false teachers according to that text. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. God is more powerful than our enemy and any circumstances that you find yourself in today. Do you believe that? Yes, he is. At the sound of his voice, the enemy flees. <laughs> At the sound of his voice, the enemy flees. The demons ask Jesus in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 29, what do you, what, what do we have to do with you, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time that voice is so enlightening eh? I told you that their destination their, their destiny their fate has been sealed the demons talking to Jesus who recognized who Jesus was said what do you want of us have you come to torment us before the time Satan, Satan and his forces have an eternal appointment and they are all subject to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. However, we must put on our armor. Amen. The full armor of God. You must put on the armor. Ephesians 6. Come on. I got to read it again. We read it and it was coincidental. That was in our bulletin this morning. But Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 13 and 8, 18 describes, 18 describes the armor that we must put on. Come on. Some of you may had this type of Bible uh, turning for a little while. Happy that you're doing it this morning. Ephesians, if I can get it. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning... At verse 13. It says, therefore, by the way, I counted some six pieces that make up the armament. You may see if you can uh, confirm that as we read. Therefore, take up the full arm of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand, stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shown your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace in addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the enemy of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. Indeed, the victory is ours if indeed we put on the full arm of God. Is it on today in your life? Prayer is interesting. Prayer, I regard, it says with all prayer, I regard as the glue that keeps all of the pieces in, in place right victory is ours today lastly let us look at our, our will to fight come on our will to fight it is true that in wartime you have deserters those who walk away uh, after losing their will to fight many things impact our will to fight to push back on the enemy the struggle, you may think, is too long. And my strength has grown weak. And so therefore, you have elected to stop fighting and, and you've turned back. Sometimes we think that there is no reward for our faith and the hope that we have 
in Christ Jesus. We, the reward escapes us. The, the, the conviction that we will be rewarded, we no longer hold on to. And so therefore we shrink back. We think the task that God has called us to is impossible. You remember those who heard him say, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. You remember those? And the Bible says that they turned back. This fellow talking nonsense. Unless I eat his blood, drink his blood and eat his flesh, I have no part in him. And the Bible says that they begin to turn back. The, the disciples who were turning, uh, who were following him. And he turned to the twelve and, uh, and he said, will you also go? That tells me, brothers and sisters, that God doesn't force us to serve him. Come on now. He doesn't force us to serve him. He wants you to invest your will in serving him. He wants you to elect to serve him. And I hear Peter say, where shall we go? Thou hast the words that leads to life eternal. And so sometimes we think that the task that he has called us to is impossible. I admit, boy, sometimes I think that. What? You want me to do that? But he just, he just cursed me up. You want me to love him? You want me to, <laughs> you want me to still give him a glass of water? You still want me to, 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 to feed him? But he just cursed me out. Yeah. I want you to treat him the way I treat you. Sometimes we turn back, we, we abandon, we, we are missing in action because we look around and believe others have it easier. Am I right about it? We believe that others have it easier. And so we say, man, this is too tough, this is, this is too difficult. Uh, it, we, we buy into the thinking of the psalmist in Psalm 73 in vain have I been righteous in vain have I served God I look around and I see the, uh, the ungodly they are fat they have no worries they have no cares and here I am struggling here I am serving you man this thing doesn't make sense then he said it was not until I went to the sanctuary that I perceived their end <laughs> he was corrected at the sanctuary when we go to God in prayer and read his word we are often corrected and then he says nevertheless I am with thee I have resolved to remain with thee and so yes there are reasons sometimes that, want, uh, that, that, that we want to embrace to leave the path that we are on but no there 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 are no reasons no there there are no sufficient reasons that come our way that should cause us to give up amen the scriptures encourages us to resist the devil and he will what come on now to resist we are charged to resist the devil and he will flee the calling to which we have been called involves the activation of our will we must respond to God's call, correction, rebuke, and chastisement in our lives. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God would be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. There is no room for a deaf air in the kingdom. Amen. We must respond. We must have his will. As our will. His will must become our will. I'll admit sometimes this is difficult. We don't feel like being obedient or responsive to his call to resist temptation or obey his word, but we must. You agree? Amen. We must. One step in the right direction makes room for many more steps in the right direction. That's a little bit philosophical, Paul. Would you go at that right? One step in the right direction makes it easier to make more steps in the right direction because God sees that and he will honor that and he will strengthen you to continue to press on finally the text says in 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 9 to 10 but resist him fight him that's what that means 
Fight him, resist him. Firm in your faith. Knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. And after you have suffered for a little while. Boy, is it a little while for true? Think about it. The span, the average span in life is what? About 70? We promised 3 score and 10. Uh, relatively speaking, it is a short time. Some of you uh, are halfway through the span, promise. Some of you just get nice, uh, the young sister there, you, you just get on track. A quarter of the way through, maybe a, t a third of the way. But, but for many of us, we are what? About a half the way through. Some of us then past the half point. So where are you going? Where are you going? You're going to abandon the ship? He says, for after you have suffered for a little while. Amen? After you, I understand it as being, after, as being after you would have engaged in warfare for a little while. The God of grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Let us fight the good fight of faith in the spiritual battle that we are in. Can you agree with that? Perhaps you have given up the fight. You have given in and Satan has had his way with you. But you see the results of giving in. You, you know you only really belong where you are. You know that he has uh, led you down the path that you shouldn't be. You see the results and it's all messed up now. Is there deliverance? Is there restoration available? Is there renewal and recharge and rest and, 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 and a warm embrace? Are these things available today? Yes, they are. For we serve a God who is willing to receive you and clean you up. Amen. Praise be to Almighty God. And so no matter where you are today, you know what time it is. To be disobedient is to reap some consequences. But God has in turn turned his back on you. He wants to clean you up, dress you up again, and empower you to fight the spiritual battle. You may not be a Christian today. Uh, you are already in a, you're in a lost state according to the scripture. You, you need to be saved, to be brought into a saved state. You need to be delivered from the kingdom of of the enemy and be brought into the kingdom of Jesus Christ and that happens through your obedience to the gospel of Jesus through your uh, believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God that he is the only means by which you will be saved he is God's perfect sacrifice the sacrifice he made on the cross was the uh, sacrifice that settled the account enabled mankind to settle their account they were in debt but Jesus paid it all he died for the whole world but the whole world isn't saved what makes the difference between the saved and the unsaved is that the saved have been obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ the unsaved are those who haven't been obedient and so you got to believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God then you got to repent of your sin Repent of those things that are wrong. You know, you know what they are. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit, the job of the Holy Spirit is to convict of sin. And I believe that he does a good job of that. But you got to listen. You got to respond to it. And then you need to confess the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And you need to be willing to be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Everyone who made it right in the New Testament obeyed that same gospel. Let's see. Some 3,000 souls on the day of Pentecost obeyed that gospel. They believed, repented, and were baptized. Who else obeyed that gospel? Um, uh, the, the Ethiopian eunuch obeyed that same gospel. Uh, who else? The, uh, the eunuch, the, uh, the uh, Ethiopian eunuch, he did obey that gospel. We, we know that the Samaritans obeyed that gospel. 
We know that um, Cornelius, a, a man from a distance, Cornelius appeared righteous. He gave, he, he prayed, he was a God-fearer, but he had to hear words whereby he and his household would be saved. Then Lydia obeyed that same gospel. Paul the apostle obeyed that same gospel. Also the Philippian jailer. And it goes on and on. The gospel hasn't changed. The gospel is for you to obey today if you want to make it right. Let's stand as we encourage you by singing the song of